Well, now that we're all homebound and deep into planning what we're going to bring into the world next, I thought people might like to know a little more about how I bring these videos to you. You might want to replicate that with your audience so you can make awesome sales videos, coaching videos, or course videos, and make them in no more time than it takes to read the script. Now, a couple of years ago, I showed everyone how to, sh you know, to set up a home studio complete with green screen, but two years is a long time in the video world. I've made a lot of changes since then. You may have seen them without knowing exactly what they were, only that things look a little nicer than they used to. Well, hopefully, except for my hair. You know, I can go to Mars in my videos, but I can't get my hair cut in real life. You know, I know, people are really suffering now, and I'm, I'm so lucky to have this as my complaint. I hope your problems are few. So, let's go behind the scenes now and look at everything that makes up Home Studio 2.0 for 2020. Yeah, that's got to mean something, right? Before we get into this, let's set the twofold purpose of this studio. Number one, make the highest quality video possible, including green screen. And two, make the videos in no more time than it takes to read a script. So, set up a system that represents the straightest possible line from the mere thought of a video to getting it on that memory card just the way you imagined it. And the purpose of this video will be to show you how and why I've set mine up the way I have. We'll start from the back wall and move to the front. Along the way, I'll show you the items I'm using while occasionally giving you the budget alternative. Okay, first of all, room size. This is all based on the room size of most homes and offices. This one uh, gives me 12 and a half feet of, of width times 11 feet of depth. I mean, after you hang the green screen, of course, which cuts off a foot and a half of the depth. Otherwise, it would be 12 and a half you know, square feet. So if you wanted to use all the depth possible, you would paint the wall or hang the screen from the ceiling. I don't want to do that because someday I may want to sell the house. But more to the point, I also want to use black screen and other color screens as well for when I'm building courses. So that foot and a half, it's an acceptable trade-off. But recently, I realized I needed more space from side to side. See, when you hang your green screen from two light stands, the legs of the stand take up a whole foot per side. That means your 12 and a half feet is suddenly 10 and a half feet. So I ordered some C stands to replace the light stands. Why? Because I could fold their legs right up against the wall and reclaim those two precious feet. Now I can show more and that gives the whole video a more spacious feel. Now the company that made my green screen went out of business, but the technology is still alive, fortunately. And in this example, like mine, it isn't reflective, which is a good thing. It doesn't wrinkle easily, and it comes with reinforced holes along the top for suspending from a frame, which is pretty much all you could ask for. And I don't really see a budget alternative to this, except for maybe a smaller room, so a smaller screen. Next. Since we're building this studio around the idea of getting a perfect green screen result, you may want to use soft boxes, as many of us do, to get enough light spread evenly. But now I supplement these with four little LED lights and two larger fluorescent lights to get more coverage on the screen. So two panels right and left down low two of these longer fluorescent lights on the floor to light the center of the screen, one panel up high in the center to light the top, and one panel for a backlight aimed on the subject, which kills the reflected green light off the screen. And by the way, 
This works just as well with larger LED lights in place of the soft boxes if you wanted to reclaim even more space from side to side. Uh, that would be the way to go. It's just more expensive, but it definitely works. Now for a detailed look at how this green screen piece is done, check out my video and the PDF called the Ultimate Green Screen Resource Guide. Okay, so let's move on to the camera. We're five feet from the lens here normally, and my tripod needs another two feet to handle the teleprompter. Tripods, the way we use them, don't need to be very portable, but they do need to pan and tilt. They need to be able to hold at least 12 pounds. The teleprompter should be easy to see and easy to use. You may have heard me talking about the Caddy Buddy, as it's a good, solid alternative to standard teleprompters like mine. But I like being able to operate it remotely, which makes your life so much easier. So I get my full-size teleprompters from prompter people and use PromptSmart Studio for the software, because unlike their tablet-based product, it works in the real world. So you never have to stop shooting because your software suddenly froze. And now the centerpiece of this whole studio, the camera. Any prosumer camera with a zoom lens can give you a shot from at least the waist up from this distance. But we're not using a fixed lens camera anymore. That's the biggest change I've made in four years. We're using the Panasonic GH5S mirrorless camera. Why? Because the footage can be up to four times sharper with two times the color sampling, which makes doing green screen effortless. It also just makes a nicer image. Before this camera, I would spend, you know, several minutes sometimes tweaking the footage in Final Cut Pro. Oh, and I just didn't want to do that anymore. With this camera, I just drop the keying filter onto the timeline and there's the green screen. It's done. I literally don't have to do anything more to it. You still have to light it right or it's a complete disaster no matter what camera you use. But once you do, the green screen process is transparent. As a budget alternative, as well as a much easier to use option, there's a Sony AX100, which I shot the last minute with, or the newer AX700. Both will give you very good results. I shot a hundred green screen videos for this blog with the uh, older AX100. But just like any prosumer camera, you need an audio adapter to get the sound from a good mic back into the camera, because sound is so much more important than most people think. It's what carries emotion, intent, meaning, and sense. If it's subpar, so is your message. For great sound, we recommend the Comica Audio Mixer, which fastens right onto the camera and becomes part of it. I use a Sony wireless mic system. Two excellent budget alternatives are the Sennheiser Wireless with Base Station or the Sony ECM Lav. Next, you'll need a monitor of some kind to help you get centered on the screen. The reason is that your flip out screen is going to be covered by the shroud that sits over the teleprompter. For that, I use this ICANN model, but since it isn't made anymore, my next choice would be the ICANN Sega 7 inch high brightness on camera monitor. Just connect it to your camera with an HDMI cable and you're good to go. And that's it. So is this the only way to set up your space? Heavens no, but it works for me. It all fires up in a minute and I only spend a few minutes a week shooting. Sure, it takes a little while to set this up, any good system does, but then anytime you wanna make a video, it'll be there waiting for you. The budget alternative to all this would be Studio on a Stick, but that's a whole different story. Again, this is for someone who wants their videos to be as sharp as they can be without taking days to make one. I know this is gonna give you quite the shopping list, but keep in mind, there are some items that will last almost forever. I've had the soft boxes and some of my microphones for 10 years. So 
Knowing what wants to be replaced and supplemented is kind of the trick, but that's what you keep me around for, right? Thanks for, thanks for washing your hands, and uh, we'll see you next time on The Visible Authority.